Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third and final session for the Spectral Indices for Land and Aquatic Applications training. This session will provide an overview of common spectral indices used for land applications. We'll start with an overview of this training as a whole and review the purpose of the training, the learning objectives, and the prerequisites. During this training, we aim to provide an overview of commonly used spectral indices for aquatic and land applications. We will discuss examples of spectral indices calculations with diverse sensors, including Landsat 9, Sentinel 2, and the harmonized Landsat Sentinel 2 datasets. For each session, we also have demonstrations of performing index calculations using Google Earth Engine. We hope by the end of this training, you will be able to recognize commonly used spectral indices in land and aquatic environments, distinguish between spectral indices to select those best suited for a given land or aquatic system of interest, compute spectral ind index calculations over appropriate areas of interest, and acquire spectral index products from a variety of sources. Our only prerequisite for this training is the fundamentals of remote sensing, which is linked here or equivalent experience. The four of us here are RSET's ecological conservation team, and we are your trainers for this series. So for the past two sessions, we focused on an overview of spectral indices and then spectral indices for aquatic applications. And this session today is focused on spectral indices for land applications. As a reminder, the homework opens today on the training webpage and is due in three weeks on November 23rd. The objectives for this session today are to recall the main concepts and determine the applications of the enhanced vegetation index, the soil adjusted vegetation index, and the normalized burn ratio. We will also calculate EVI, SAVI, and NBR over regions of interest in Google Earth Engine, and we will also discuss NASA developed use cases for land indices. Before we jump in, let's start by reviewing a bit of knowledge from the previous two sessions. So spectral indices are simple band ratios that highlight a specific process or property on the land or aquatic surface. And the normalized difference vegetation index, also known as NDVI, is one of the most used indices for analyzing vegetation health. And remote sensing reflectance is the fundamental remote sensing quantity from which most ocean color products are derived. For example, chlorophyll, particulate and organic carbon, light absorption by CDOM, suspended sediments, and more. And as a reminder, if you have any questions throughout the session today, you can type them into the questions box and we will do our best to address them at the end of the presentation. We will also answer any remaining questions in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website about a week after this training ends. Okay, so let's start with some spectral indices for land applications. The first index we will review is the normalized burn ratio, otherwise known as NBR. Here we see that we can use the reflectance properties from satellite imagery to identify healthy vegetation versus burned areas. In healthy vegetation, there is reflectance in the green and near infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's why we see healthy vegetation is green. When we compare the healthy vegetation spectral signature to those of burned areas, we notice some stark differences. You can see this pretty clearly for the spectral signature curves of low, moderate, and high burn severity where healthy vegetation has this large peak in the near infrared, bare soil and burned areas have much lower peaks in the near infrared. And in the case of high severity burned areas, there's much less response in the near infrared. You can see that healthy vegetation has low reflectance in the short wave infrared, but burned areas have high reflectance in this wavelength. With these spectral characteristics, we can identify burned areas and distinguish it from healthy vegetation. To take advantage of this difference in spectral response between healthy vegetation and burned area, we use the normalized burn ratio, or NBR, to map post-fire conditions. NBR uses remote sensing data at the near-infrared and short-wave infrared to map burned areas and ultimately assess burn severity. You can see how this calculation is completed here on the right. Similar to NDVI, NBR is a unitless value from negative 1 to 1. 
a high NBR value that is closer to one indicates healthy vegetation, while a low value that's closer to negative one indicates recently burned areas in bare ground. NBR is a commonly used metric for identifying areas where vegetation is recently burned due to fire. Here you can see an example of NBR in action. These images on the left show pre, during, and post fire NBR from the Mendocino complex fire that burned in California in 2018. The area in red outlines the total area impacted by the fire. NBR is also critical to burn severity estimates. To estimate severity, we compare NBR pre and post fire using the difference normalized burn ratio or DNBR. Here we have a basic run through of how it works. So we calculate the NBR prior to a fire and then after a fire, and we take the difference between those images. You'll notice that the DNBR is calculated by subtracting post fire NBR from the pre fire NBR. And once DNBR is calculated, an analyst will need to threshold the DNBR values into classes of low, moderate, and high burn severity to produce a map that looks like this one on the right, with the highest burn severity, burn severity areas mapped in red. There are suggested threshold values for burn severity thresholding, and using this approach, we can identify the severity of a fire. Here is an example of how NBR was used by NASA DEVELOPS Fall 2021 Southern Wyoming Ecological Forecasting Team. This team monitored cheatgrass in Southern Wyoming and Northern Colorado to inform management efforts post Mullen fire. Cheatgrass is a concern for the community because it may easily invade disturbed soils in a post fire environment. It creates a positive feedback loop where fire has the potential to create more cheatgrass habitat and cheatgrass has the potential to serve as fire fuel and increase the frequency, intensity, and size of fires. Here, we see that the team used both NBR and DNBR to analyze the impact of the Mullen fire. The team derived NBR raster values from June 2020 pre-fire imagery and June 20, 2021 post-fire imagery using the near-infrared and shortwave infrared bands. You can see the pre- and post-fire NBR is the middle images on the top and the bottom. They then calculated the DNBR using the pre and post fire rasters, and that is the image furthest on the right. Here we can see that the team created a burn severity map showing a DNBR on a continuous scale. They also performed anal analysis on sheet grass percent cover at 150 field plots and DNBR values at the plot locations to analyze the relationship between the two. Next, we have the Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, also known as SAVI. The Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, or known as SAVI, minimizes the influence of bare or nearly bare ground when trying to assess vegetation. This index could be used in semi-arid and arid regions like the southwestern United States, for example, or any place there is greater bare ground or soil cover in relation to the vegetation. Here is the near-infrared and red bands are still used, but a correction factor is applied. The soil brightness correction factor, known as L, is defined as 0.5 to accommodate most land cover types. An SAVI ranges from negative one to one with low values corresponding to a small amount for a small cover of green vegetation in the area. Here we have an example of how SAVI was used by NASA DEVELOPS Fall 2021 Bhutan Agriculture Team. The team developed a crop mask for rice and created a data collection protocol. Here we have a chart of the methodology for the project. The rice points for the data were provided by the end user, the Department of Agriculture, and also collected using Google Earth Engine Satellite View and used as input data for the project. These data were then imported into the Collect Earth Online, also known as CEO platform, and used to develop 30 meter plots with 25 gridded samples to be classified manually into agriculture, non-agriculture, rice, and non-rice. For the data processing and analysis, the input data from CEO was imported into Google Earth Engine, where the team computed the various indices to aid in the classification by the random forest model to distinguish between areas with rice and without rice. These indices included the normalized difference vegetation index, the normalized difference water index, 
the normalized difference moisture index, and the soil adjusted vegetation index. And these were computed using Landsat 8 data. The final steps involved creating the crop mask for identifying rice in Bhutan using the random forest classifier as the primary model and a classification in regression trees, also known as a part model, as a baseline model to compare it to. To analyze the results, the team used Colab, Google Earth Engine, Arc Pro, and QGIS. For their results, the team successfully developed the crop mask for rice using the random forest classifier for the eight districts of Bhutan. Visually, the random forest model uh, proved to be more accurate and precise than the CART model as the result was more robust using the random forest classifier. And the random forest model gave equal level of importance between the various indices which use optical indices, polarization indices, and tasseled cap. Statistically, the random forest model was 91.8% accurate, while on the other hand, the CART model was only 82.9% accurate. The differences between the statistical values could be explained by various errors and uncertainties. And now our third and final index we will discuss today is the Enhanced Vegetation Index, also called the EVI. EVI is another measure of vegetation health, and it can be used in place of NDVI to examine vegetation greenness as it is more sensitive in areas with dense vegetation. It is particularly useful in regions with high biomass because the NDVI can oversaturate or hit a maximum value in these regions, whereas the EVI has a higher threshold and it can identify more subtle differences in these regions. The formula here on the left shows how EVI is calculated. You can see that it uses the near infrared, red, and blue bands, and how the atmospheric adjustment, also known as C, adjusts for canopy background in some atmospheric conditions. And here is an example of how NASA develops Spring 2020 Costa Rica and Panama Ecological Forecasting 2 team used EVI in their project. So this project aimed to identify current and future areas of environmental concern in La Amistad International Park to inform resource management efforts. The image here is an example from the team's short-term forest change tool, showing the entirety of forest change in their study area between the beginning of 2016 and the end of 2017. The legends on the left labeled vegetation change shows the categories of tree cover loss and gain. The most loss is shown in red and dark green is the most gain. Intact forest is shown in yellow and green, whereas moderate loss and gain is displayed. The tool serves as a baseline for the team's canopy cover calculations, which eventually determine forest change or not. The team used both EVI and SAVI, which best suit the tropical environments in the search for forest change. So pixel by pixel, this tool compares it first to the tree cover calculation in the year 2000 to check if there was a tree there. If not, the tool then sees if there was a gain in tree since 2018. If there was a tree in, 22, in the year 2000, the team needs to make sure that for the year specified by the dates, there wasn't a loss in the meantime. The tool is then classified if a pixel has tree cover for that year and calculates EVI for the start image and subtracts the pixels indices to evaluate the change. This is another example of a map from the tool and it displays the forest change for the same period of time as the previous figure, but this time we zoom in on a peninsula in Southern Costa Rica in the Osa Peninsula region. Here we see more variation of loss display, displayed in the different hues of orange, ranging from zero to 80% loss. In this next part, we will discuss the Satellite Needs Working Group, the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel dataset, and some of their upcoming indices products that you may find useful. Through the White House National Science and Technology Council's U.S. Group on Earth Observations, the Satellite Needs Working Group partners with federal agencies to identify high-priority, sustained, and unmet needs for satellite Earth observations. The Satellite Needs Working Group conducts a biennial survey to formally document and communicate satellite Earth observing needs to NASA and other space-based Earth observation providers. The Satellite 
need survey obtains information about key federal agency objectives that require the application of satellite Earth observations, as well as specific measurement requirements. The survey is conducted to identify potential data gaps in the current NASA program of record and existing data resources that meet agency needs. These are a few examples of the satellite needs working group solutions that are being implemented to meet agency needs. Here is a list of upcoming vegetation indices products provided by the Satellite Needs Working Group. These products are created using the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel dataset and are expected to enter operations in quarter three, 2024. The Harmonized Landsat Sentinel 2, also known as HLS project, is an extension of research conducted at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, that takes input data from the joint NASA USGS Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 and the ESA Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B satellites to generate a harmonized analysis ready surface reflectance data product with observations every two to three days. The HLS project is a major outcome of the Satellite Needs Working Group assessment from 2016. In that assessment, federal agencies and end users identified the need for a more frequent Landsat light observations to track short term changes in vegetation and other land components to support agricultural monitoring and land cover classification at moderate to high resolution in both the visible and thermal components of the electromagnetic spectrum. Spectral similarities between the Landsat 8 operational land imager and the Landsat 9 OLI 2 and the Sentinel-2 multispectral instrument present an opportunity to harmonize data from these sensors to generate higher frequency imagery products for land surface monitoring and application. Here is an overview of HLS. It has a two to four day temporal resolution and a 30 meter spatial resolution. The image on the right shows an overview of HLS processing and how the L30 and S30 products are created. At NASA, the HLS algorithm is developed by the HLS science team and is supported and operated by the Interagency Implementation and Advanced Concepts Team, also known as IMPACT, located at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The data products are archived and distributed by the LPDAC, which is a partnership between NASA and the USGS. Coordination between these partners on the data lifecycle ensures that HLS data are high quality, freely available, and accessible to end users with two to three day latency. HLS is a collaborative effort between NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, Impact HLS, the LPDAC, and the Satellite Needs Working Group Management Office. Here you can see what each role the groups have to play. And here are some links to various resources related to HLS. You can preview HLS data on NASA Worldview and experiment with different bands in the Earth Observation Browser. You can also look at the HLS S30 and L30 pages, access data on NASA Worldview and Earth data, and even use HLS products on Google Earth Engine. On the right is a tutorial for the HLS Superscript, where you can subset, pre-process, and download HLS data directly from the LP DAC. HLS has several applications, including the agricultural land use change and algorithmic assessment of cloud freshwater. In one instance, BBC reporter Virginia Close reached out to the HLS production team for imagery showing the impacts of rice farming on Catawba Lake, a hippo habitat in the remote region of Tanzania. This imagery will likely be used in a planet Earth style documentary slated for release in 2025. Also, the HLS production team gets frequent questions as to the statistical accuracy of the cloud and water detection algorithm for large bodies of water. They are collaborating with JPL and the USGS on evaluating these tools. Here is an HLS image of the Tabi Lake, the river that feeds it, and rice farming happening nearby, as mentioned in the previous slide. 
At this time, we will start a demonstration of calculating MBR, EVI, and SAVI in Google Earth Engine using Sentinel-2. If you click on this link right here, you should be able to access the code directly. And I encourage everyone to follow along as I work through this demonstration. All right, so we are now starting the demo in uh, Google Earth Engine for part three of our spectral indices for land and aquatic applications. In this demo today, we will be calculating the normalized burn ratio, the soil adjusted vegetation index, and the enhanced vegetation index over three different areas. So we will be using Sentinel-2 to do it. So if you remember from the last two sessions, we did use Sentinel-2 for some of those uh, index calculations. So at least the beginning of the script should look a little familiar until we get to the specific index calculation sections. So with that being said, let's dive in. Starting here on line 15 with the very start of the script, we are just creating a title for the map window, same as we did in part one and part two. Uh, the title for it is just part three, land indices. We're looking at the uh, style, the font weight, the font size. We're keeping it pretty, pretty simple. And we're just adding that to our map. Again, just this nice little area right here, part three of land indices. Getting into part one, applying a scale factor and applying the cloud mask to Sentinel-2 data. Uh, very similar to what we've done the past couple of demonstrations, just working with that Sentinel-2 imagery to remove those clouds. So that function mask S2 clouds starts here on line 35. We're just getting rid of cloud and cirrus pixels. We're setting those flags to zero, indicating clear conditions here on lines 43 and 44. We are uh, applying that uh, scale factor right here, dividing by 10,000 on line 46. And then at this point, all we've done is create the cloud mask, we do need to apply it to our data. So we're going to start with importing our data, the variable S2, Sentinel2. I'm just going to pull up the image collection here. This is the name of the image collection in Google Earth Engine. That's what we're going to be working with today. So here you can read all about it, read the description, look at the bands. We're certainly going to be doing that for the indices later. You can get all the image properties. And that's where you can find it and we'll come back to that and here we are just filtering by the date uh, we're just looking at july 2019 we are filtering to get the least cloudy pixels uh, and then there we are applying that that cloud mask we created up above to remove any of the cloudy pixels from our least cloudy imagery and then we are taking a median of those values which brings us to part two here on line 58, where we will be calculating NBR over Alberta, Canada from a 2019 wildfire, and we will be using that Sentinel-2 data to do so. So we're going to start by defining the region of interest, the ROI, very similar process as we've done in the past couple of indices calculations that we've done. So here on line 61, uh, our region of interest is just geometry. It's this geometry that I created down below. It's this bright yellow color today. Um, that was just a square I drew over the Alberta Canada, Alberta Canada wildfire in 2019. If you want to change the geometry to another region of interest at another time, you can just change uh, from geometry here to the shape file that you've imported, a different geometry, any of that fun stuff, and it should automatically update throughout the code wherever ROI is, which is helpful. All right, so here we are just clipping that uh, Sentinel-2 imagery to our region of interest, and we are just naming it Alberta. We are just taking that, this yellow shape, like a cookie cutter, and we're cutting that Sentinel-2 imagery so we just get everything within this shape here, which we're going to look at in a minute. But here's the fun part here on line 66, calculating the normalized burn ratio, the NBR. So here we can see that NBR is calculated as near infrared minus shortwave infrared divided by near infrared plus shortwave infrared. And here in Sentinel-2, that is band 8, 
for the near infrared and band 12 for the short wave infrared. And here on line 69 is where the calculation happens with the function dot normalized difference because it does follow that pattern of band 1 minus band 2 divided by band 1 plus band 2 as it has in a couple of our previous indices. So we are just using uh, a new variable called NBR and we're taking that, that little cookie cutter clip of Alberta Canada imagery and we are applying dot normalized difference with those bands to perform that NBR calculation. And here on line 70, we're creating the variable NBRVis and we are just doing the negative one to one for the minim, uh, minimum and maximum values and the palette from white to green. And then here on line 72, we're using map.addLayer to add the NBR to our map down below. We are naming it Sentinel2NBR. And here on line 75, we're using map.centerObject, focusing on that normalized burn ratio at the zoom level 8. And that's what you can see down here. So if you look, uh, Sentinel2NBR, this is the layer that we're looking at right now. You can see the healthy vegetation is a green color, and you can see, you can really see the extent of the burned area as this white color because it has such a lower vegetation value. You can really see the extent of this burn here in 2019. And right now, the visualization is just from negative one to one, but same as we have in the previous sections, we are printing the minimum and maximum values in our region of interest. So it's not necessarily always going to uh, contain the values from negative one all the way to one. It's usually something within them. So we are using uh, the reduce region and the reducer dot min max on line 78 to print the maximum values, which you will see right here on the console. Again, right here in the console tab on the right, you can see min and max Alberta, Canada. Open it and you can see the maximum value is 0 0.998 and the minimum value is negative 0 0.888. So if we go back up to line 70 here and we replace those values, for the minimum max, like I'm going to, we should have a slight improvement in the visualization. So instead of looking at everything from negative one to one, we are just going to look at the minimum and maximum values for a region of interest. So I'm going to hit run again now that I've input the minimum and maximum values, and it's running. And here we can see it's not a huge difference in visualization because the values are so close to negative one and one already, but you can see a little bit better sort of variation in the burn itself and the surrounding vegetation. So that's our NBR. All right, so let's move on to part three, calculating SAVI over in Western Australia with Sentinel-2. So similar process before, we are applying a cloud mask to our Sentinel-2 collection. We're naming it variable S2 collection, filtering that imagery, and we are mapping it. And here uh, we are defining our region of interest. We have changed our region of interest. We are no longer going to look at Canada imagery. We are here to look at Western Australia. So that's going to be our second geometry called Geometry 2, which we'll get to look at in a moment. But that is our new geometry. So again, if you want to perform SAVI over a different area, you would start here at Geometry 2 for your specific region of interest. And here on line 100, we're going to perform that calculation. So the uh, formula for SAVI if you might notice, is not the typical formula that we've seen, that we've seen before with the band one minus band two divided by band one plus band two. It's a lot more complicated than that, which means that 
the uh, typical function we were using before, dot normalized difference from our previous indices calculation, we can't use that anymore because that function, that's the wrong formula. So this one, we have to sort of create, we have to code by hand, more by key. And we're going to do that right here on line 102 by starting with a function. So we're creating a function. The name of the function is get SAVI. And then we start the function itself. So we have a variable called SAVI. And here we're going to use image.expression. And here is where you can write your own formula, your own expression. And that is where we're going to manually write in the formula for SAVI. You see here where it's near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red plus L. If you remember L from the slide, that atmospheric correction factor, 0 0.5 typically. And then we are multiplying that by 1 plus L again. And so we're working with bands here. We're working with individual values. There's a lot going on. But Google Earth Engine is our friend, and we're using dot expression, first of all, just to write out that formula. And we've done that step right here on line 103. And then from here, from line 104 to 108, all we're doing is just specifying what specifically we mean when we write in something like NIR for near infrared and R for red or L. So we've written out this entire expression on line 103. And from here, we're just identifying what exactly these values are. So in this formula here, when we say near infrared, we are specifying that we want band B8. So we're using image.select B8. And we do that because band 8 is the near infrared band for Sentinel-2. That's the band that we want to use for this calculation. And the same thing happens here for R. We're using dot select B4 for the red band for Sentinel-2. So we are specifying the specific bands that we want here in our data set for these uh, bands in this formula, in this calculation. And from here, if you remember L, we're just using the value of 0 0.5. And it's not a specific band, it's just a number. So instead of saying image.select, we're not selecting a band, we're just letting Google Earth Engine know that the value we want for L is 0 0.5. And then from here, we just complete that function. We end it here on line 110. And then on line 112, we're going to start to create or apply that SAVI over our area. So here we're using uh, we're creating the variable called SAVI, and that's just our vegetation index. And what we're doing is we're taking that Sentinel-2 collection, and then we're using dot map get SAVI. So we are applying that SAVI function from above. We're using that, that filtered Sentinel-2 imagery that we created right here on line 90, and we're applying that SAVI function. We are calculating that. They we're taking the medium value over that date that we're working with. They're taking the medium value of SAVI from July 2019. And then we are clipping it using dot clip. So we're clipping it to the region of interest, that little square that we want, our geometry from before that we've specified. So as you can see, this process uh, is a little more complicated because we can't just use the dot normalized difference function, but in just a couple of lines of code, we have performed the same thing, uh, even though we had to manually type out and create the expression here. So it can be done. All right, and from here, we're just setting our visual parameters as before with the variable SAVI viz, and we are doing negative one to one in the palette of white and green as we usually do. And then we are adding that to our map as a layer. On line 121, map.add layer. Again, we're just using SAVI, the visualization parameters that we selected, and we are naming it Sentinel-2 SAVI. And then here on line 124, 
we should uncomment this line, meaning we should get rid of these two slashes at the beginning. So you can also do that by holding down control slash on a Windows computer, which is what I have, or I believe it's command slash on a Mac, or if you just want to erase, you know, use the backspace button here on line 124. You just want to make sure that map.centerObject is this nice purple color, so that way the code will recognize it and run. And we've done that here, so that way when I hit run up above, once the code is uncommented, as I've just done, you'll notice down below it has changed from Alberta, Canada to our uh, new region of interest here. Let me zoom out to see it a bit better. Western Australia. So we did that with map.centerObject. Dot center object tells Google Earth Engine, please zoom to this location instead of just starting from a worldwide view. I want to go right here. So we've gone straight to where SAVI is, our geometry two, which as you can see is this turquoise blue color. I can turn on and off. So that's what we have. And so this is our SAVI over Western Australia. I'll even turn on the satellite. You can change, you know, map to satellite here. Look at the variation in the, um, the values. So you can see it changes quite a bit from barren land to places with a lot of vegetation. Here we can zoom in and see that variation. I can even zoom in a lot to see some of those differences. And right now, these values are from negative one to one. And what we want is to get our min and max values to calculate what are the actual minimum and maximum SAVI values in our area. We can do that right here on the console, min and max Western Australia. The min and max values here take a bit longer to calculate just because uh, the region that I drew, the geometry that I drew is pretty large. So it just took a bit longer to calculate, but we do have those min and max values here. The maximum value is 0 0.813. The minimum value is negative 0 0.51. So I'm just gonna copy those values and let's go to line 118 where we set our SAVI viz. So I'm going to start by replacing the maximum value from 1 to 0 0.813. And I'm going to do the same thing for the minimum values. Instead of negative 1, negative 0 0.518. I'm going to hit run again, and we should see a slight change in the visualization here. Zoomed out a bit too much. All right, so we should see a change or an improvement in the visualization. It should be a bit easier to see the variations between the white and the green in the scale of vegetation in the area. I'm going to hit run. Let's see. Aha! I think that looks a bit better. I hope you think it looks a bit better. And you can see the darker places with more vegetation versus the, the lighter places with less vegetation here during July 2019. All right. Okay. And then here up in the code, again, we're just calculating that min and max, which you saw right here on the console. And that is our SAVI over Western Australia. All right, our third and final part here, part four, starting on line 137, calculating EVI over the Amazon rainforest with Sentinel-2. So same process as before. We are applying a cloud mask to our Sentinel-2 collection. We are just pulling in that Sentinel-2 collection. We're looking at July 2019, least cloudy imagery, cloud masking. Hopefully that process is starting to feel familiar to you. And then from right on line 147, we are going to start calculating EVI over the Amazon rainforest. So 
similar to SAVI, if you remember from the slides, this is not the same sort of normalized difference pattern that we're used to. It has its own unique formula. 2.5 times the near infrared minus the red band divided by near infrared plus six times the red band minus 7.5 times the blue band plus one. So we definitely can't use dot normalized difference for that. We have to, same as we just did, manually type in this, uh, this formula by creating a function for it and making it an expression. And that happens right here on line 149. So here we start with function. We are naming it get evi. And here's the expression. And we're using image dot expression for our variable evi, this formula for evi. And same as before, we are just writing in that formula that I just discussed. This is the EVI formula here. And from lines 151 to 155, we are just naming what we mean in these values. So right now in this formula, we just have 2.5. That's the value we want. And for NIR, we want the near infrared band, which in Copernicus or Sentinel-2 imagery, that is band eight. So for near infrared, we are just using image dot select band eight. When I say near infrared in this formula, I'm referring to band eight. We're doing the same thing for red on line 153. When I say I want a red in the formula, I am asking Google Earth Engine to select band four in Sentinel two using dot select band four. And then finally, with the blue band here, when we use the word blue, what we want is to select the band B2. So again, this is all very specific. These bands here are very specific to Sentinel-2. So if you want to perform an EVI with another satellite or another sensor, you might have to use the same formula up above. But instead of B2, it's whatever the name of those bands are for the other satellite and sensors. So keep all of that in mind when you start to use this code on your own outside of this training. But here we have calculated uh, EVI with Sentinel-2 using bands two, four, and eight, and our lovely formula right here. All right, so here on line 160, we are just defining our region of interest. Again, right now, this is all for the Amazon. But if you want to change your area of interest, you do that right here on line 160, geometry three. That's just another square I drew or more of a rectangle. But if you want to change that, uh, you do it right here on line 160. And then ROI three should be your new area of interest throughout the code at another time. And right here on line 162, we have the variable EVI. So now that we've created the function to calculate EVI, we're going to apply it to that Sentinel-2 collection, to that Sentinel-2 imagery that we created here on line 140. So here we're going to use dot map get EVI. Again, we're using dot map to perform the EVI calculation. That's what's happening here. So we've officially apply the calculation with dot map and then the name of our function get EVI. And then we're taking a median of those values to compress all of that into an image rather than a collection of imagery. We use dot median to take it from a whole image collection down into a single image. We can look at our map below. So we're just taking the median there. And then we are clipping it to our region of interest. Again, we're taking that cookie cutter and we're just cropping out or clipping our imagery to the specific geometry that we want. And then here on line 168, we're using the variable EVIViz. You are using the values negative one to one and the palette from white to green. And then we add it as a map to our, or we add it as a layer to our map here on line 171 using map.addLayer, which brings us to right here on line 174, similar to what we've been doing and what we just did get rid of those two slash marks, uncomment it. Again, it's either control and slash at the same time on a Windows or command slash at the same time on a Mac, or if you want, you really can just 
backspace the flashes away. But what we want is this nice purple code. You can see it's not a comment, but something that we want to run. So I'm going to hit run. And now, instead of looking at Western Australia, now that that's uncommented with map.sensor object, we should be able to see part of the Amazon, very small part. But this is part of the Amazon instead of Australia. Okay. And so uh, we just have it to zoom level 11. And then this is our, our EVI. So you can see if you zoom in some variation, which is pretty cool to look at, I think, in the rainforest. You can see in the very light areas, this white, those are the rivers, it's water, snow vegetation, and then some darker regions. But as a whole, this is a pretty uniform color. But again, we are using just the uh, color or the values negative one to one. So if we print our min and max values and use those instead, we should see an improvement in the visualization. So we are just printing those min and max values here with this variable in line 177. We're using dot min max over our geometry, our region of interest that I drew earlier. And then we want it at the scale of 10, which is the scale of the bands that we used, and then the maximum number of pixels so it doesn't time out. And then we print that right here to the console, min and max Amazon rainforest. We can see that the max is 0 0.89 or seven and more, and the minimum is 0 0.1249 and some more. So what we're going to do is replace those values where we set the visual parameters here on line 168. So I'm just going to copy some of those values here, and I'm going to replace the value 1 with the actual maximum value of our region. And I'm going to do the same thing, just copying and pasting, or you can even type it in if you want, on line 168, the minimum and maximum values that were printed here. And so I'm going to hit run again, and we should see a slight visual change in how our imagery looks in terms of the variation between uh, high and low vegetation. You can see, I can even hit satellite, play with how see-through it is to see how the different forested regions look and so evi is great over places with a lot of biomass the amazon rainforest is a great example of this you can see some places that are darker and some places that are lighter and that is our evi and that does bring us to the end of the script so at this point we're going to go back to the slides and summarize the training as a whole and uh, get to the Q&A portion. And now to summarize the spectral indices for land and aquatic applications training as a whole. With mulching spectral imagery, individual bands in a band composite can be transformed to get certain features and patterns to stand out better. Simple ratios between the reflectance of the land surface can be used to highlight representations of ground objects. It's important to know the intended applications of a spectral index. Certain indices were created to analyze land areas such as NDVI, EVI, SAVI, NBR, and more, while other indices were created to analyze aquatic areas such as NDTI, NDCI, SAI, AFII, NDAVI, and even more. In addition to calculating indices by hand, there are also several indice products available from a variety of sources. As a reminder, the homework opens today and is open for the next three weeks until November 23rd. You can access the homework directly from the training website. In order to get a certificate of completion for this training, you must attend all three live webinars in which attendance is recorded automatically, complete the homework assignment by the deadline, and you will receive a certificate via email 
approximately two months after the completion of the course. At this time, we would like to thank Pontus Olofsson, Brian Vandermeulen, and Lisa Tan for their contributions and feedback to this training. If you have any questions about the training, please contact us at these email addresses. As a reminder, you can follow our set on Twitter and YouTube, and we also encourage you to explore our sister programs linked in the lower right here, the Develop and Severe programs. The use cases we reviewed today were all previous developed projects. Here are some more linked resources that you may find useful for your own interest in research related to the content covered in this session. Thank you again for attending this training, and we will now begin the Q&A part of today's session. All right, so throughout the training today, we've been compiling the questions that you've all been adding to the questions tab, and we've been starting to answer some of them here. So we'll go through some questions now up until um, the end of our time today, so I think about 10 more minutes or so. But if we don't get through all of the questions that we have, we will also post this Q&A document on the training website in a few days where we'll be able to answer them all and clarify, and you can find that uh, there. So with that being said, uh, we can jump in, starting with question one. What is the suitable threshold method for DNBR or DNDVI? So for DNBR um, and NBR, we have covered that in a previous RSET training using Earth observations for pre and post fire monitoring. And in that training, we talked about DNBR thresholding and even performed that in Google Earth Engine. So we included the link there. And there are also, um, for the thresholding itself, we followed the reference proposed by the USGS, which is linked here at the top of question one. And uh, there's also another instance here of altering your threshold values, um, and that relies on analyst interpretation. So these can be modified based on your understanding of the particular ecosystem you're working with, and most importantly, the ground-based information, such as the composite burn index. So a lot of the time when uh, there's different levels of burn severity. Researchers will go out into the field and collect samples to perform that analysis themselves for that thresholding in that specific area. So you have all those different options you can look at for the DNBR. I hope that's helpful. All right, on to question two. Is the man Kendall process possible in Google Earth Engine or the trend analyzing process like SendSlope possible with the NDVI using Google Earth Engine? And it looks like both the man Kendall and the SendSlope processes are available within Google Earth Engine. And there's a really nice uh, training developed by Google Earth Engine itself called non parametric trend analysis that covers both of them. And the link to that is included. So you can Feel free to use that if you'd like to use that. Uh, check those out if you'd like to use those for trend analysis. Okay, question three, how can we assume a trend in NDVI? So we can observe trends through time series modeling, looking at something like NDVI over a series of time to see how that changes with seasonality and whatnot. We talked a little bit about that, I believe in the first session, um, but I did include a link to Google Earth Engine's time series modeling tutorial right here. So I hope that helps you sort of understand how you can look at a parameter like NDVI over time and see how there's a trend with it. Okay, question four. Can you say something about different approaches to aggregating pixel level indices at higher levels beyond summary statistics at a regional level? For example, are some indices more or less noisy or easier or harder to aggregate? Do patterns of variance imply different habitat types, things of this nature? All right. Well, I think this is a very fun question because it sounds like 
you've sort of attended this introductory webinar that goes over the very basics of uh, spectral indices and you're looking to get more information, how do the indices work in different regions, which ones are better or harder to work with um, in more specific use cases, perhaps um, something beyond just a regional analysis. Um, I think there's lots of great use cases out there. I know we used a couple use cases from develop projects here in the training, um, but I think the question to this sort of answer depends on specifically what indices you're interested in or you know, which different indices you're interested in, what region you're interested in, and uh, the science of looking at that specifically. Um, I think there's some great RSET trainings out there, some of the intermediate and advanced trainings that use these indices in more complex ways that I think might help you understand and answer some of these questions. So I can provide some links to other advanced RSET trainings that use these indices that you might be able to look at. Uh, Juan in Sativa, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add for this question. Britt, I mean, Brittany, this is one. I think we, you, you put it well. Uh, it, it definitely, uh, uh, the, the the kind of uh, science question that that uh, the person uh, wants to uh, to answer is, is probably critical on, on on this thing, as you mentioned. Okay, great. Um... Okay, on to question five. What is the best product for monitoring the health of vegetation and can the products distinguish tree species accurately? So I said that the best products tend to vary based on your region of interest and the type of vegetation that you're working with, as well as things like the spatial and temporal resolution of whatever data you're working with. Um, but in terms of uh, data products themselves to identify specific species. The first thing that comes to mind is a, the National Land Cover Database as well as any other land cover data set that's available. But again, that does come down to the, uh, the uh, resolution of maybe 30 meters or so. Um, if you're looking to use something like a spectral indices or something to distinguish tree species, um, I would say that, again, depends on the tree species itself. You can sort of identify deciduous trees um, during like winter months, for example. You can use things like NDVI to see how the greenness changes with seasonality. Um, but for specific species, I think you'd have to work with something like hyperspectral data rather than multispectral. Um, at least that's my opinion. Juan Sativa, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that one. Uh, this one, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Probably hyperspectral would be the best method. And as you mentioned, it, it, it will highly also depend on the on the spatial resolution of the of the data set and uh, to see if and, and also the density of uh, of the specific uh, uh, tree species i would say uh, see if they if they can actually detect you know at the species level can be detected or not great thank you uh, for question six, can the products distinguish crop species? I would say very similar to question five, um, depends on the data set that you're using and probably hyperspectral is better. Um, definitely referring to what Juan said about the um, density of the crops or trees themselves. Um, so, yeah. Okay, question seven. Is cloud masking necessary if you have selected images with cloud cover of less than 1%? Um, no, you don't have to mask out clouds if you have cloud-free imagery. Um, I personally always perform a cloud mask since I feel I can miss cloud or cloud shadow in an image that I just perform a visual check and it looks cloud-free, but that's not necessary if you're using a different way to determine uh, cloud cover and make sure that 
in whatever research you're doing that you just note um, how you pre-process the data, including uh, including uh, whether or not you perform a, a cloud mask or not. Okay, question eight. Is the greenest value or index the same as the NDVI? So I believe you're asking about NDVI versus GNDVI, which is the Green Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And I included a link about what GNDVI is here. Um, it's Esri's ARC Pro description of uh, GNDVI and how to perform it, including its calculation. Um, but the differences are that while well, NDVI uses near infrared and red, bands, um, G and DVI uses near infrared and green, and it focuses more on chlorophyll. And you can sort of read that link that um, Ezra uses to sort of describe like why you would use it in the instances in which it's helpful. So there are subtle differences and best uses for both of them. Personally, I haven't used G and DVI, um, but I hope that at least helps answer your question about whether or not they're the same thing. Okay, um, I guess this will be our last question because we're right at uh, our time here, but question nine, which index has a higher accuracy for detecting irrigation areas? Um, I don't know if you mean from the different indices that we've used for this training or if there's another indices out there for detecting irrigation areas. Um, there are plenty plenty of indices out there. So I don't want to just say off the top of my head, which I think is best. I'd rather look into it and provide an answer on the document later. Um, Honor Sativa, I don't know if you're familiar with irrigation areas and their relevant spectral indices, but I think this is uh, to be determined and you can check the Q&A document later. Okay, uh, well, for the sake of time, I think that was our last question, but keep in mind that we will post the completed Q&A document for this session on our training website in a couple of days. Um, but as of now, this marks the end of the Spectral Indices for Land and Aquatic Applications training series. And going forward, you can find all of the lesson materials and the homework on the training webpage. Uh, thank you all again for being a part of this session and have a wonderful day.